Father God, this night we want to thank you for the opportunity you give us to gather, to come and worship you, Lord. And what a great thing it is, Lord, that our hearts are turned toward you, our, our minds, Lord, our thoughts, Lord, as we come uh, just uh, in awe of you, Lord, come uh, worshiping you, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you that we can come and kiss towards you with our lips, Lord, and all, with all the entirety of our being, uh, lifting our lives up to you. Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness, with, uh, for your love for us. And we ask as you have blessed the worship, you might continue to bless. Uh, uh, we, we enjoyed fellowship before the service and after the service, I'm sure. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you now through the study of the word. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Great to be here. Glad, glad to see you folks all. You know, last, uh, last week we were out and uh, Hank did a real great job in the book of uh, Joel, the first two chapters. So I just asked them to continue uh, uh, through the book of Joel and finish it up tonight. So uh, it's a great thing. Uh, one of our leaders, Hank Rupel, why don't you uh, give him a welcome as we ask him to come up. Thank you. I'm not worthy of that, but thank you anyway. <laughs> thank you. It's good to see Russell and Yvonne back with us and the whole family, so praise the Lord for that. Let's, uh, let's open a prayer for the message. Father, thank you for the opportunity you give me tonight to be able to, to deliver your word to our church family. Thank you for helping me through the study, and I pray, Father, that Holy Spirit would meet us here and help me deliver the message that you've given me to give to them, Father, and bless the word as it goes out. And we know that your word will not come back void, so I pray, Father, you would bless us tonight in this message from the book from Joel. Thank you, Father, for your blessings and all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be in uh, Joel chapter 3 tonight, as Russell was uh, mentioning. But before we turn there, let's open our Bibles to Joel chapter 1. And I'll be reading, I'll be using NASB tonight. Last week my message was done in the New King James, but tonight I want to do chapter 3 in the NASB. But well, first we'll summarize our study in Joel 1 and 2 last week. In chapter 1, the introductory phrase, the word of the Lord, was commonly employed by the prophets to indicate the message was divinely commissioned. Chapter 1, verse 15, the first occurrence of the theme, the day of the Lord, is found. It also appears later in 2.18, 3.1, to 21, when God pours out his wrath on man, ex exonerating God's people and judging the Gentiles. But here, Joel directs the warning towards his own people. In verse 2 through 20, the prophet describes the contemporary day of the Lord. Verse 2, Hear this, you elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Hear, give ear. The gravity of the situation demanded their undivided attention, emphasizing their need to make a conscious, purposeful decision in the matter. Verse 2 stood out to me because of the comparison between the godless conditions in Joel's day and the falling conditions unfolding in our day. Judah suffered massive devastation caused by the locusts, and the whole world is distressed today by the coronavirus, so pretty, pretty comparing. In verse 3, Joel says, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. The message isn't an old story being told over again, but it's something they have never experienced before. God has left them helpless and destitute because of their spiritual adultery and their unfaithfulness. The fall of Judah was laid at the feet of the spiritual leaders who didn't teach the people the terrible dangers of falling away from God. They not only allowed the people to fall into false worship, but were guilty themselves. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of Satan, but it's much more severe to fall into the hands of God when he pours out his wrath. Joel's theme is the day of the Lord, the day in which God reveals his attributes of wrath, power, and holiness. 
this being the day of his wrath, the day appointed by the Lord to take vengeance on the Jews for their sin was dreadful and intolerable. In chapter 1, the day of the Lord is experienced historically by the plagues of a locust swarm upon the land. Joel indirectly talks about their prosperity. Their vine vats were overflowing. The fig trees and pomegranates and apples, all the fruit trees were loaded down. Their land was fertile. The barns were filled to the brim and olive oil was flowing like wine. That's in 110 to 17. And se excuse me, in 17. Their cattle never failed. Their herds were multiplying and flocks were plentiful in 118. The spiritual condition and material prosperity brought spiritual poverty during Joel's time. Much of their time was spent partying and drinking, much of like what we see today. This land is devastated by locusts as we read in verse 4. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Joe tells his people in verse 5, Awake, you heavy drinkers, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine, for it has been eliminated from your mouth. It took a natural disaster of epic proportion to wake the people up. God has his way to bring his people around. He can't let them go because he loves them so much. He loves us so much. The locust end brought. In verse 6, Job provides a clearer and prophetic, poetic, excuse me, description of, of locusts. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has jaws of a lioness. In verse 7, 10, and 12, Job speaks of the impact of the invasion on agriculture. It has made my vine a waste and my fig tree a stump. It has stripped them bare and hurled them away. Their branches have become white. The field is ruined. The land mourns. The grain is ruined. The new wine has dried up. Flesh oil has failed. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field have dried up. In verse 11, the farmers and the vine growers also had reason to mourn since the fruit of their labor had been destroyed. Be ashamed, you farm workers. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, and all the trees of the field are dried up. In chapter 2, verses 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9, Joel describes the locusts as a marching army. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses, so they run. With the noise is chariots, they leap about on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people drawn up for battle. They run like warriors. They climb, like the wall, they climb the wall like soldiers, and each of them marches in line, nor do they lose their way. They do not crowd each other. Every warrior of them marches in his path. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. They storm the city. They run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. They have the appearance of horses, they gallop along like cavalry with a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. They charge like warriors, they scale walls like soldiers, they all march in line, not swerving from their course. This vivid and poetic description of locusts isn't unrealistic. Locust swarms are very common phenomenon in the Far East and even today. This, is, this I don't know, I just, it dawned on me this week when I was making the study that this wasn't the first locust swarm that happened to the Israel people. It's, remember that when they were try, trying to leave, wanted to leave Egypt, they brought a swarm of locusts on Egypt, which helped Carol, uh, Scott, uh, excuse me, the, help him leave. <laughs> <clears throat> And as if this isn't enough, Joel describes the drought in, in verses 17 through 20. The seeds have dried up under their shovels. The storehouses have become desolate. The grain silos are ruined because the grain has dried up. Now the animals have grown. The herds of cattle have wandered aimlessly because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep have suffered. 
To you, Lord, I cry out, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the animals of the field pant for you. For the stream beds of water are dried up, the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, seeds are shriveled under clods, storehouses are in ruins, barns have been broken down, and, gr and the grain has dried up. The result of this is all the material blessings have been taken away. All the religious sacrifices have been taken away. Cutting off religious sacrifices for Hebrew was way more serious than loss of material blessings because the religious sacrifices guaranteed them a covenant relationship with the Lord. As long as they were able to offer the sacrifices, they felt that the Lord was bound by his covenant to keep his part and continue to take care of them. But when the sacrifices are taken away, there is no guarantee of any blessings from the Lord. Although innocent, even the judge, in judgment, excuse me, even the animals suffer the loss of food. Producing and cattle are, are, are sheep. The sheep are starving. Excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> there was no ordinary dry period. It was a drought so bad nothing could, could live. Their only chance for help was to cry out to God. When men and women turn away from the Lord, trusting in other things, even the very ground is taken away from under their feet, making them realize just how shaky that ground is they stand on. Joel's concern isn't limited in these disasters. He sees them as symbols deeper, of deeper significance, the day of the Lord. It may be that the hordes of locusts that covered the sky and blotted out the sun caused the prophet to reflect on the day of the Lord. Joel tells them in chapter 1, verse 15, Verse 15, woe for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction. In chapter 2, verses 1, Joel tells them, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the habits of land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And in verse 11, he says, the Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is indeed very great, for mighty is one who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome and who can endure it? Five of the 19 explicit references to the day of the Lord in the Old Testament are found in this short book of Joel, 115, 2, 1, 11, 31, and 314. The prophets call for genu genuine repentance. In chapter one, verse 12, verse, Joel gives the, his first call for repentance after the locust invasion. Put on sackcloth and mourn, you priests. Wail, you ministers of the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. For the grain offerings and the drink offerings have been withheld from the house of your God. In chapter 1, verse 14, Joel's second call for repentance is more intensive. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Return to the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 12 through 14 reads, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your heart and not merely your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy and relenting of catastrophe. Who knows, he might turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, resulting in a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. There are several instances in the Bible where God did change his mind and reverse curses. When a man changes, he's unaware of, of, of the changes in himself and views it as though it were a change in God instead. The priority of repentance was given to the priests and the religious leaders not to just make an outward vow, show but to get, and give lip service, but with real genuine repentance. Call to repentance. Joel tells them in chapters 1, verse 13, Put on sackcloth and mourn, you priests. Wail, you ministers of the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering have been withheld from the house of your God. The spiritual condition of the nation at every, any given time in history was a barometer of their, of, of their spiritual condition. It's the same with our church today. Does the spiritual condition of our nation reflect the, the spiritual condition of the church? Not for the Calvaries, but for a lot of the others it does. Chapter 2, verse 16, the priest called the rest of the people from the oldest to the youngest. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, 
have the groom come out of his room and the bride out of the bridal chamber. A fourfold blessing to read in chapter 2, verse 18 to 27, that God will heal their land. In verse 19, the blessings are described in the same agricultural terms as the devastation that was caused by the locusts. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make your disgrace among the nations. The emphasis isn't on the material blessing, it's on the Lord who provides the material blessing, on the relationship with and the knowledge of God that provides the full satisfaction. God's ultimate purpose for blessing his people is that they would want to know him and grow in their relationship with him. The purpose of blessing and meeting all our needs abundantly isn't that we enjoy the gifts and forget the giver, but that we would find our joy, our fulfillment, and our satisfaction in him alone. Repentance defined in Webster's Dictionary of, of American English is a change of mind or a conversion from sin to God, a relinquishment of any practice from conviction that it has offended God. The basic idea is to turn around, changing the course, making a U-turn, change in life's goals and priorities. This is what, as the people of God, call, that, that we, are, we must do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. Instead of running after the material things the world offers, instead of finding happiness in things of the world, we need to seek the true joy, fulfillment, and contentment in our relationship with our Lord. The ultimate purpose of God for blessing us is that we seek him and desire to know him more, love him, and serve him. The Lord will pour out his spirit. In chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, God will pour out his spirit for their universal spiritual restoration. Joel begins in chapter 1 with the devastation of the locusts and ends in chapter 2 with the eternal blessing of the presence of the Lord with his people. Those who have trusted the Lord and committed their lives for his glory and those who long to fellowship with him and seek to know him are all enjoying those blessings now. Chapter 1, verse 1, the introductory phrase, the word of the Lord, was commonly employed by the prophets to indicate the message was divinely commissioned. Chapter 1, verse 2 through 20, the prophet describes the temporary day of the Lord. I had read that already. Look. That, am I repeating myself? I don't think so. Anyway. Verse Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Hear, give ear. The gravity of the situation demanded the undivided attention, emphasizing the need to make a conscious, powerful decision in the matter. Verse 2 stood out to me because of the comparison between the godless conditions in Joel's day and the falling God, failing godless conditions that are unfolding in our day. Judah was suffering massive de devastation caused by a locust plague, and today we're facing the coronavirus pandemic. Tell your children, let your children tell their children and their children in another generation. The message isn't an old story being told over again, but it's something they have never experienced before. God has left them helpless and destitute because of their spiritual adultery and their unfaithfulness. The fall of Judah was laid at the spiritual leader's feet who didn't teach the people the terrible dangers of falling away from God. They not only allowed the people to fall into false worship, but were guilty themselves. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of Satan, as I've read before, but much more severe to fall into the hands of God when he pours out his wrath. The text makes a decisive transition in chapter 2, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 21, with the advent of 2.18. Assuming the period of time between 2.17 and 2.18, Israel will repent, devotes the remainder of the book to restoration. As a result of their repentance, the three major concerns of 1.1 to 2.17 are answered by the Lord. Physical restoration, 2.21 to 27. Spiritual restoration, 2.28 to 32 and national restoration, 3-1 to 21. Accompanying the outpouring of the Spirit will be full salvation and deliverance for all who put their trust in the Lord as their Redeemer. Joe compressed together in prophetic fashion the events separated by thousands of years. Crucial points of history are the events of the locust plague in Joel's day, 
the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out universally and made available to all mankind around 33 AD. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, the events of the Great Tribulation are separated from the day of Pentecost for more than 2,000 years. From the event of, from the advent of chapter 2, oh, excuse me, something happened with my copy. <laughs> I had to make the copy here, but I'd like to make it at home, but I ran out of time. Excuse me? The days of our life are our days where we do what we please. The day of the Lord will be the day when he, our judge, shall require an account of all we've done but a great promise that God will save everyone who calls upon his name. Now we turn, please turn to Joel chapter 3, Judgment in the Valley of Decision, which is our, supposed to be our lesson for tonight. Reading verses 31 to 3, a promise to bring back scattered and mistreated Israel. The Lord judges the nations. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into the judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine so that they may drink. In those days and at that time, those prophecy still concerns the time period connected with it shall come to pass afterward mentioned in 228. This is the broad period of the last days initiated by the ascension of Jesus at the birth of, Christ, of the church on the day of Pentecost. Many have the wrong idea of the last days thinking only in terms of the final years of months immediately following the rapture of the church before Jesus returns in glory to the earth. Scripturally, we can think of the last days as a period of time that began with the birth, birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Since that time, the church is heading towards a distant point in time that represents the consummation of all things. Since the day of Pentecost, the church has been running parallel to that consummation for over 2,000 years. When I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, in a lesser immediate sense, this was fulfilled in the return from the Babylonian exile. In the greater ultimate sense, it will be fulfilled in the end times gathering of Israel to the point where an expected Israel welcomes Jesus saying, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, Paul writes, salvation will come to all Israel. I will also gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel here describes the final gathering of the nations in rebellion against God at the battle of Armageddon in, in Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 to 16. There is really no place in Israel known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat, but their name Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges, describing God's place of judging, judgment. And so most likely it'll be as the, we read in Revelation, probably in the Valley of Megiddo. This will be a judgment of all the nations. Joel was written at the time when a terrible plague of locusts brought the judgment of God on the people of God. He uses Joel chapter 3 to assure his people that all the nations will be dealt with. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. God's complaint against the nations is that they have mistreated his people. Primarily this is in view of the way the nations treat Israel, but also extends how the nations treat the church. When God's people are mistreated, God takes it personally and will avenge it. In the judgment of the nations, Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 26, the criteria isn't Jesus Christ, but how the nations have treated the people of Israel. The judgment determines of those held on the earth after the eternal glory who will be allowed to enter the millennial earth and who will go straight to judgment. They have cast lots for my people. It's bad enough for, to, for man to regard any human life as cheap. It's worse to regard the people of God as cheap. God remembers and will repay. Reading 3, 4 to 8, God warns the nations that he will retaliate against those who have mistreated his people. 3, 4, moreover, what are you to me, Tyre, Sidon, and all the re regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me with retribution? But if you are showing, 
the retribution swiftly and speedily. I will return your retribution on your head. Since you have taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, and some of the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order, sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them from the, their territory, behold, I'm going to stir them up from the place where you have sold them and return your retribution on your head. I will also sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Will you retaliate against me? God virtually is challenging the nations to come against him or his people. He vows to return their retaliation upon their own head to those who come against him. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. The nations treated God's people with contempt and had no sense of, of their worth. So God will repay them with the contempt they put upon his people, vowing to return your retaliation upon your own head. Reading verses 9 to 13, gathering the nations for a war of judgment. 3.9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for the holy war. Stir up the warriors. Have all the soldiers come forward. Have them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak man say, I am a warrior. Hurry and come, all you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves there. Bring down, Lord, your warriors. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will set to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the grapes, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Prepare for war. God challenges nations to prepare for war against him. The nations are led in rebellion by their kings and are resisting God in Christ. Gentiles are in view here, here, and they're rebelling against God and his rule. Cross-reference Psalm, Psalm 2, this the word that they rage against the nation, this voice of rebellion, rage, means to grind or gnash the teeth. The voice has been heard down through the centuries, but it's being heard in a greater way in these last days. As never before, there's a united voice of rebellion against the rule of God in Christ. Beat your plowshares into swords. If they're going into battle against God, they should have every weapon available. They should practice their best positive thinking. Let the weak say, I'm strong. But the most positive thinking won't work when man sets himself against his maker. I will set the, to judge all the surrounding nations. Although the nations will come against God and his Messiah with every weapon and the most positive frame of mind, it'll be all for nothing. Reading 3.14 to 17, the day of the Lord in the valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and his utter voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The glorious future of Judah. 317, then you will know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in, on Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will no longer pass through it. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Joel looked out upon the valley of Jehoshaphat at the battle of Armageddon and, and sees multitudes facing their eternal fate. It's really a valley of decision for those who fight against the Lord and his Messiah are in the wrong place in the Valley of Decision, ultimately fulfilled at the Battle of Armageddon. Joel's context here is exactly the opposite. Man does not stand in the Valley of Decision, but it's God who does the deciding, not man. It's a Valley of Judgment. We need to decide for Jesus now so we won't stand in that Valley of Decision. Joel goes back to, this, to, the, prescript, to the descriptions of cosmic, cosmic cataclysms that were mentioned in chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. In the midst of it all, the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel, and we will restore both his people and his city to glory. Reading 3.18 to 21, blessing on God's people, desolation for the nations. And on that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. 
Egypt will become a wasteland and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. After God's final victory, there's a lasting abundance and the days of drought are just a distant memory. Said Jesus, Egypt shall be in a desolation along with the enemies of the Lord and his people. And a spring will go out from the house of the Lord. The valley of Acacius, valley of Shinnom, was a place associated with both failure and victory. It's located on the eastern side of the Jordan River to the north of the Dead Sea. It was a, where the king of Moab sent his young men, women to the men of Israel to seduce them into idolatry and sexual immorality in Numbers 25, 1 to 3. It was also a launching place for the armies of Israel when they set out against Jericho and Canaan in the days of Joshua, Joshua 2, 1 and 3, 1. When water from the house of the Lord flows down to the valley of Acacias, then God's grace and provision covers the past. Every sin, every victory is covered over by him. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. God will show mercy to his people and grant them forgiveness. The prophecy of Joel, which began with the severe plague of locusts, ends with a promise of restoration and redemption. As I watch and wait and know the signs of the times, I wait for the rapture of the church with great anticipation. Since I have more years behind me than I have in front of me, it comforts me to know that I'm out of body present with the Lord. And since I have more years, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a win-win situation for me. What a great promise God will save everyone who calls upon his name. Times are getting worse, and we have to pray harder. Amen? Sorry it's short, but I messed up. I should have printed it at home. Father, thank you for your word, for your word is truth. Thank you for the opportunity you give me to, to be able to give your word, to offer your word to those that are listening. And I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will convict and guide them with the word that he's placed in me for the words that, that, he, that are going out to, you, to those. And I thank you, for, Father, for drawing us here this day, for, for giving us all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for Russell and Levon being back with us, and thank you for all the things you are doing here at Calvary Chapel downtown. I do want to lift up our church family, each and every one to you, continue to Bless them and keep them and protect them from all harms, dangers, and evils in the world. And continue to help us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And with thanksgiving, we give you all praise, honor, and glory. Keep our minds and hearts stayed on you, Father. And Father, thank you for our salvation. Jesus, thank you for loving us. And Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit for convicting us and guiding us into all truth. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.